Strangers on a Train from 1951 was an Alfred Hitchcock masterpiece. I love this film, and it's one that every time I watch it, I catch something new to appreciate about it. Now, before I jump into the review, let me just say that long ago, back in the 1990s, when I was a mere whippersnapper working at the now defunct Family Video, that it was here that I really learned to appreciate the films of Alfred Hitchcock. You know, a large part of what drew me into his films initially was the gorgeous actress Grace Kelly, who I originally caught in the film Rear Window. So I watched her in other Hitchcock films like Dial M for Murder and To Catch a Thief, and it was here that I really began to appreciate Hitchcock as a filmmaker and his careful attention to detail, his great actors, the realistic sets, the location footages, and stories that just drew you in with captivating themes, often that of a suspenseful scenario of a man on the run or the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, with those familiar motifs of shady characters, the dark humor, the unexpected twists and turns. You'd often feature trains, staircases, and of course, murder, often by strangulation. And Hitchcock seemed to have so many of these things in his films. Discovering old Hitchcock films, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. It's like finding treasure buried out in an Egyptian temple. It's just the greatest thing. You watch these films and you're like, this is so good. Why don't more people watch films like this? You know, what we get from Hollywood today, the offerings are so bland, but these films of the past, sorry, let me get off my soapbox. And in, in any case, the story I was trying to get to is that when I worked at Family Video, I could usually choose what was playing on the TVs around the store. And you can bet there was going to be Hitchcock playing, even though I think management would have preferred I was playing some of the hits of 1995, but I think I wore down the Casablanca videotape with how much I played it there at Family Video. Ah, VHS tapes, good times. Okay, I really started this review with a lot of rambling. Let's get into the review. Strangers on a Train was a classic from 1951. The film opens up with a very clever sequence of two characters moving on a train station to get on a train. But more specifically, we just see two different sets of shoes, both making their way aboard the same train, along with some very lively Dmitry Tiomkin music. They board the train, they take their seats, and then one shoe accidentally brushes against the other. And this is the method that Hitchcock uses to introduce our characters. And we finally see their faces as they start to talk to one another. And it's here that we see the two primary characters of our story. We have the character Guy Haynes, played by actor Farley Granger. He is a tennis pro who meets this talkative and slightly creepy character Bruno, who is just chattering away. Bruno is played by actor Robert Walker. Now, Guy is just trying to be polite. He's listening to this character, but you can sense he just wants to be alone. But this Bruno character knows a lot about Guy. And when he sees his cigarette lighter, he points out, ah, I see, it says, from A to G. And he figures out that it's from Anne, daughter of Senator Morton. So, yeah, Bruno has this creepy, obsessive amount of detail that he knows about Guy. But, as he is a well-known tennis star, I guess that's okay. You know, because it's going to be in the newspapers and stuff. Now, were it me in this situation, I would have been out of there pretty fast. But, whatever. We get to the fact that Guy has a troublesome wife that won't agree to divorce him and only wants to stay married to him for his money. And Guy doesn't have a chance to be with Anne, who he really loves. Now it's here that Bruno makes this crazy proposition. Now Bruno himself has some major dad issues. <laughs> and I mean it, his dad is a nutcase. And he proposes that these two strangers who both want someone in their life killed, swap the murders. And because they are strangers on a train, there would be very little suspicion of each other being accused of the different crimes. Now, right away, I love this setup because Bruno is, all right, maybe just a tad assertive, a little predatory and a little too much in this guy's face so far. But Guy just sort of humors him. And by the way, notice some of the details of the dishes of food, the bottles, and just all the things that Hitchcock sets up in the room. And it's something I noticed more this time while watching, just those careful details. 
that he incorporates into the film. A little more on that at the end of the review. Well, Guy has lunch with Bruno. He's just humoring him, basically, listening to his crazy schemes, kind of laughing a little bit, and he's ready to leave at his stop. As Guy leaves, Bruno asks, just at the very end, if he thinks the idea is okay. Guy just kind of replies with this glib, patronizing, sure, those ideas are all okay, and then he leaves. Uh Uh-oh. Well, Guy goes into town to Miller's Music Store, and he talks to his estranged wife, Miriam, played here by actress Casey Rogers. And we see right off, she is straight up nasty. She just wants his money, but it's more than that. She's pregnant with another guy's baby, but she wants Guy around for his money and refuses the divorce, and she's really, really nasty about it. So this leaves Guy in quite a pickle, because he just wants to be with Anne. So he angrily leaves, he calls Anne up and talks about everything in a huff. And we'll see more of Anne in the film as we go. Now, Bruno, meanwhile, meets with his mother, actress Marion Lorne, where Bruno gets his nails done by her. And yeah, he's got some weird parental issues going on here. And he overhears his dad saying that he wants to have him institutionalized. <laughs> wow. But, you know, his mom thinks the world of him, and she brings him in to show the latest painting she's been working on. And <laughs> listen to the jarring music in this scene. I love it. That's father. Bruno jokes that it's a picture of his dad. But she sadly says, I was trying to paint St. Francis. <laughs> I love it. Well, Bruno puts his plan into action. And he is out in pursuit of Miriam. You know, Guy's estranged wife. She's out laughing and partying with two other guys, and he's just stealthily following her around this carnival. By the way, I know it was built for this film, but I still love the look and feel of carnivals from the early 1950s. You know, just the the music and just the food and the tents and all the interesting things they would have done 70 years ago. It's just, you know, I love those attentions to detail and just kind of a neat window into the past. Well, anyhow. Bruno is not so subtly following her. She notices this, and, you know, we see her kind of throwing him, like, playful expressions. Maybe she's a little intrigued about this creepy stranger, even as she's there with two other guys. Yeah, she's a character, but she's curious about him. And, you know, he's there, and he hits the bell to win the prize and all of that stuff, and he follows them on a carousel, and then finally into a tunnel of love. And I love the fake-out scream. Well, he finally meets up with her alone, and he kills her. And then it's there that we see the infamous scene of the killing reflected in her fallen glasses. It's such a great sequence how Hitchcock constructs this scene. Well, Bruno makes his escape seemingly without any suspicion at this point that we can see. Now, we cut to Guy. He's on a train listening to this drunken Professor Collins singing away, actor John Brown you know, for a little bit of comic relief. Guy arrives at his place in D.C., but then he hears from the shadows Bruno calling to him. When he goes out and confronts him, Bruno confesses to the murder. Now, Guy is, like, freaking out. He's ready to call the cops. You know, he didn't mean for any of this to happen, but then he realizes that he'll be discovered as an accomplice to the murder if he goes to the police. Now, watch this scene. I love how Hitchcock constructs it with the framing of these bars. Look at how initially Bruno is behind them. But then when Guy realizes that he's in over his head in this situation, we see him too behind the bars because he's in the same mess now. I love it. You know, so it's clever little details that Hitchcock incorporates that you just catch as you watch the film. Well, Guy leaves and Bruno just quietly walks off. He's a calculating, creepy character. And we know... We haven't seen the last of him. So Guy gets a call from Anne, and he goes to see her, and they go to meet with her father, Senator Morton, played by Leo G. Carroll, who I've seen previously in other Hitchcock films like North by Northwest, and her younger sister, Barbara Morton. She's played here by Patricia Hitchcock, who was also Alfred Hitchcock's daughter. It's very cool. Senator breaks the news 
about the murder of his wife. And Guy, he knows it's happened, but he kind of goes along with it. And it, it's funny to me watching the scene how the character Barbara, she's the one kind of walking around, thinking out loud, carefully considering the murder alibis, analyzing the details and so on. It, it's funny because she's doing it in a Hitchcock detail fashion and it's Hitchcock's daughter. It's just good stuff. So Guy is summoned to meet with the police and meet with Captain Turley, who's played by Howard St. John, who I just caught in the film 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. He was one that, watching him in that film, got me interested in watching Hitchcock again, actually. So Guy says that you know he has an alibi. There was this Professor Collins, you know, the drunk guy on the train that was singing, and he will remember him for where he was that night. But unfortunately, they talked to Professor Collins, and he was far too wasted to even remember him. Captain Turley lets him go, but he assigns some detectives to follow him, keep an eye on him. Now, Bruno keeps up with this stalking, and Guy is trying to ignore it. But, you know, while walking around Washington, D.C. with one of the police, he spots Bruno watching him from a distance. Now, sure enough, the stalking continues. And at one point, while Guy is out walking with Anne, he actually runs into Bruno, who is insistent on him keeping his part of the bargain. He even leaves a note with a key and a map to the house of where his dad is so that Guy can go and kill him. So we cut to a tennis practice. It's here we get to one of the greatest scenes Hitchcock has ever made. And honestly, for me, this is the one scene from this film that sticks with me. As the audience is watching the tennis game, all their heads going back and forth, Bruno just keeps his eyes on Guy. So now Bruno is picking up his game a little bit, and he starts getting cozy with the senator and with his family. Now Guy discovers this, and Bruno acts all innocent and introduces himself to Guy. But oh, that weird reaction he has when he sees Barbara and her glasses. He's a nut, and he gets easily triggered by things like thick glasses. You know, he kind of has like a momentary flashback to the carnival, and we hear the music in his head. Well, we go to a party. And there's Bruno who just shows up and he's making the rounds and socializing. And the senator doesn't remember inviting him because, you know, Bruno just showed up. And Anne looks very alarmed about it. Bruno starts chatting with the character Mrs. Cunningham, actress Nora Varden, who I've seen in other films like Sound of Music. And she was even briefly in Casablanca. And she seems fascinated with Bruno's morbid talk about death. He's going to do a friendly demonstration <laughs> with her of murder by strangulation. Because, I mean, hey, who wouldn't want to learn more about getting strangled? But as he's doing this demonstration, Bruno sees Barbara again. And he sees the glasses. And there's that triggering. And he hears the carnival music in his head. And he almost goes into a trance remembering the murder. And he actually starts strangling this poor old woman. And people rush in and they break him up and they take him away to another room. Guy comes in, meets with him alone, finally just punches him and tells him to get out. You know, he's going to bring him out to his car. Anne, meanwhile, she's starting to put it all together, you know, with the glasses and everything. And she confronts Guy about it. And Guy finally reveals all, gives her all the details, including how he's basically trapped in this diabolical situation. Now, later, Guy decides to do it. He's going to go ahead with the murder. And he calls up Bruno, says that he's on his way. And he shows up at Bruno's parents' place. He has to sneak past a lot of shadows in the dark, a lot of those crazy Dutch angles, and eerie music by Dmitry Tiomkin as he makes his way to commit this murder. <laughs> So he's in the house. He makes his way past a big creepy dog on the stairs. He gets to the room. There's somebody sleeping in the bed. And it's here that Guy tries to wake Mr. Anthony to warn him about his lunatic son. But surprise, surprise, it's actually Bruno there who is waiting. And Guy pleads for Bruno to get some mental help. And then he slowly leaves. Now, Bruno pulls a gun on him. But we know... He can't really shoot him. That would do away with his nefarious plans. 
So it's still a creepy scene, but Guy slowly makes his way down the staircase and leaves. Now the next scene, we see Anne go to visit with Mrs. Anthony, I guess to kind of plead with her. And well, she's just batty. She dotes on Bruno and she thinks it's all just a big joke, Bruno and his wacky sense of humor. And Anne has no success in convincing Mrs. Anthony. Then later Bruno, who had been listening in, shows up and starts to taunt Anne that it was actually Guy who murdered Miriam and that he was the one who left his lighter at the scene of the crime. And yeah, ah, the days when it wasn't just, you know, your wallet, your keys and your cell phone, but it was a wallet, keys and cigarette lighter. <laughs> well, in any case, Bruno's really got poor Guy framed here. And, you know, all of these details are important because Guy believes that Bruno is going to leave the lighter at this carnival grounds at sunset in Metcalf to finally get him framed for murder. This lighter would firmly put the blame on him for the crime. Well, we cut to a tennis match. And again, just a note, it's beautifully filmed location footage. The lights and the darks of this film is just so well done. And there's really an authentic look and feel to it all. Guy's plan is basically he wants to finish all three sets of tennis and then sneak away to meet up and catch Bruno and Metcalf before he leaves a lighter there. The detectives are there, they're watching him, and they need to bring him in for questioning at the end of the game. So the walls are starting to kind of close in on poor guy. And you know, leave it to Hitchcock to actually film a tennis match in a way to make it look interesting. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of tennis, but the way he films it with the quick cuts, the ball flying at the camera, you know, the swift motions, all done in a way that just makes the tennis game look exciting. You know, Hitchcock was just the best. Meanwhile, Bruno was on his way to the carnival grounds, but while waiting for the train, he drops this telltale lighter down a storm drain. And what follows is a brief, but very creepy sequence of suspense as he is reaching and reaching for it. Well, Bruno finally gets a lighter and he's on his way. Guy finishes his tennis matches and with the help of Margaret, manages to give the detectives the slip and he gets away to head to the train station to get to this carnival in time. And as we build to this grand conclusion, I'm not gonna give you any more spoilers about the end of the film, but wow, what a great conclusion. You know, in terms of excitement, this is right up there with like North by Northwest for me. That sequence at the carousel, no spoilers, but if you've never seen this film, go and do yourself a favor, go rent this film, and check it out right now. Now some closing thoughts here, all right. I've been rambling on and on about this film, and rightfully so, as it is a masterpiece. Hitchcock gets a lot of credit for films like Psycho and The Birds. Honestly, I find myself leaning toward this film as being one of his best. The acting, the story, the sets, the cinematography, all of those carefully crafted details just make this one of his finest. I just love this film. I think that the mark of a great film is how well it stays with you after you watch it. And this is definitely one of them. You watch it and then you're thinking about it later. Like, wow, could that really happen? <laughs> the concept of a psychotic stalker with a madcap double murder ploy. I mean, that's already spooky enough, but throw in the fact that he is sophisticated, refined, and he can worm his way into social situations. It just makes it that much creepier. You know, I understand now why people on trains would rather just bury themselves in a <laughs> cell phone and avoid interacting with other people. So the film was based on the psychological thriller novel, Strangers on a Train from 1950, written by Patricia Highsmith. Raymond Chandler, you know, the creator of Philip Marlowe, he came on board to adapt the story into the film. It worked closely with Hitchcock and apparently the two didn't get along very well. And even though Chandler is credited as the main author of the script, it was almost completely written by Chesney Ormond, who was only credited in this film as the second author. At the time that this film came out, Hitchcock was apparently on a cinematic lull. He had just made two films that didn't do as well at the box office, Under Capricorn and Stage Fright. This film, however, 
turned things around for him. It was very successful. It's interesting, too, I was reading some of the trivia that Hitchcock originally wanted William Holden for lead role of the tennis pro Guy Haynes. And to me, that would have been awesome because, you know, William Holden is awesome. But he wasn't available for the film, so he signed Farley Granger instead. And he had worked with him before. He was one of the young killers in Hitchcock's Rope from 1948. That's another great film I did a review of a while ago. Some thoughts on Farley Granger here. I do remember his character from Rope and what I like about him as an actor and with his character here and in Rope is that he really comes across as a, a calm and ordered character on the outside. But there is that dark undercurrent to him that makes him perfect to be paired with a nutcase like Bruno. And we see this early in the film at scenes like, say, the music store. His character, Guy, he goes to meet with his estranged wife and he's able to keep it together for the most part. But when his nutty estranged wife starts pushing his buttons, he's not beyond losing it a little. You know, he grabs her and starts shaking her, you know. And likewise, later in the film, we think that he might have gotten to the point where he was pushed, where he's going to go ahead with a murder. As if provoked enough, he's capable of violence. That dark undercurrent I really like about this character. And Robert Walker as Bruno was just flawless in this film. To me, the greatest films out there don't just have to have believable and relatable protagonist characters, but they need to have a well-defined, plausible antagonist as well. And Robert Walker did this perfectly. I mean, sure, there's times you're watching and you wonder, uh, how plausible could this situation have been? But you know what? He's cunning enough and scheming enough that you're willing to go along with it. You know, paired with a weird, doting mother and an overbearing monster of a dad. And the fact that he is this well-refined, cultured character. I mean, he even speaks French at one point at a party. We see this character of Bruno is truly frightening. And also, he's not afraid to get up close and personal. You know, gets right up in the face of a character to manipulate them. And he's all very calm, soft-spoken, almost effeminate in his manner at times. Yet, he says the right things to keep you interested, to keep you hooked. I mean, wow, it's well-defined characters like this, namely in a villain, that make for, I think, the great antagonism to the hero, especially when that villain starts to draw that hero into their dark world with them. Great stuff. Apparently, this was the last theatrical movie for actor Robert Walker. He died eight months later after filming apparently from an allergic reaction to a drug he was using to treat his alcoholism. It's very unfortunate. It was interesting to me that his son, Robert Walker Jr., who bears a very strong resemblance to his father, he's an actor I remember most distinctly as the character Charlie X from the original Star Trek series. So that was pretty cool. The movie featured some amazing cinematography by Robert Burks, namely things like the shadowy city streets, as well as the bright and inviting tennis courts and the dazzle and the lights of the carnival setting. It looks tremendous. And he would be Oscar nominated for this film. He should have won the Oscar, I think. Now, a comment related to a very slight spoiler here. So if you want absolutely no spoilers, just skip ahead. But near the end of the film, there's a carousel scene and the carousel will lose control. And there's a sequence where this old man will go crawling under it to try to stop it. And this was the real deal. I mean, this old guy was actually climbing under the carousel. No special effects here. And Hitchcock claimed later this was the most dangerous stunt ever performed under his direction. And <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was watching it. I was like, oh my goodness, how did they do that scene? But it's pretty cool in the film. The train station scene at Metcalf was actually filmed in Danbury, Connecticut at the old train station on White Street. It is still there and it's now a museum. I was looking around with Google Street View. Sure enough, it looks pretty much the same. And seriously, Google, did you have to blur out the face of the gigantic 20-foot Uncle Sam? <laughs> really? I mentioned earlier Hitchcock's attention to detail, including that of food. And while reading through Charlotte Chandler's biography of Hitchcock, she had these comments specifically about the food in the film. I just wanted to bring up this quote. I thought this was really interesting. It starts, preferences in food 
characterize people, Hitchcock said. I've always given it careful consideration so that my characters never eat out of character. Bruno orders with gusto and an interest in what he is going to eat. Lamb chops, French fries, and chocolate ice cream, a very good choice for train food. And the chocolate ice cream is probably what he thought about first. Bruno is rather a child. He is also something of a hedonist. Guy, on the other hand, shows little interest in eating the lunch, apparently having given it no advanced thought. In contrast to Bruno, and he merely orders what seems his routine choice, a hamburger and coffee. So that's the end of the quote, and I read this, and I really respect that level of detail. I mean, how often does a filmmaker give consideration to what foods a character eats? You know, maybe one of the few examples I can think of would be when I used to watch Miami Vice, one of my favorite shows, where I think producer Michael Mann would put an emphasis on food details, namely in an episode like Lombard, I remember them eating Italian food, but maybe there are others. Hey, my three fans, can you think of any examples? Leave them in the comments below. One final anecdote regarding Patricia Hitchcock. I thought she was noteworthy in this film, and my understanding was that her father never really gave her any preferential treatment on the set. She was treated just like any of the other actors. And her character, although not a major one, was very memorable, you know, namely, as I mentioned, that expression of terror when Bruno was staring at her. And, you know, that really stuck with me as well from this film. There was one amusing anecdote about her. It's also from Charlotte Chandler's biography of Hitchcock. Patricia said, quote, my father said, how much would I want to go up on the Ferris wheel? I said, I'm not going up. You know how scared I am of heights. He said, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And I said, okay. So I went up with the two young men who were playing Laura's two boyfriends. And I have a picture of us waving. As a joke, some electricians turned off the lights and pretended they were walking away. Obviously they weren't. I think we were probably up there two or three minutes at the outside. They turned the lights on, brought us down, and that's the story of the Ferris wheel. They said, Daddy left me up there all alone in the dark for two or three hours, and that's a story that has persisted. They made a lot out of that because they were trying to make it a horror thing and make it fit my father's character. But my father wasn't ever sadistic. It just wasn't true. The only sadistic part was I never got the $100. <laughs> Oh, anyhow, that's my long-winded review of Strangers on a Train. And look, if you haven't seen this masterpiece already, go and check it out. It is a work of art from Hitchcock, and it's totally worth checking out. I know what I must do. Hey, let's take him out.